Sanhedrin asks Putin and Trump to build third temple in Jerusalem. The nascent Sanhedrin is calling on Russian President Vladimir Putin and U.S. President-elect Donald Trump to join forces and fulfill their biblically mandated roles by rebuilding the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. Rabbi Hillel Weiss, spokesman for the Sanhedrin, contacted Breaking Israel News to announce that the election of Trump, who has promised to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, coupled with Putin's expressed desire for the temple to be rebuilt prompted the Jewish court to send a letter offering the two the opportunity to act as modern-day Cyrus figures, non-Jewish kings who recognize the importance of Israel and the Temple. Cyrus the Great, king of Persia in the 6th century BCE, announced in the first year of his reign that he was prompted by God to make a decree that the Temple in Jerusalem should be rebuilt. Thus saith Koresh king of Paras, all the kingdoms of the earth hath Hashem, the God of heaven, given me, and he hath charged me to build him a house in Yerushalayim, which is in Yehuda. Ezra 1-2. Cyrus sent the Jews under his rule back to Israel with a considerable sum of money with which to rebuild the temple. The Sanhedrin plans to call on the two world leaders to take up this ancient biblical decree and support the Jewish people in their holy mission. Rabbi Weiss explained that the U.S. elections have made the eternal Jewish dream a very real possibility. The Sanhedrin's letter notes that Trump's upset victory was due to his support of Jerusalem, and reminds Trump of his campaign promise to move the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, effectively recognizing the city as the capital of Israel. The Jerusalem Embassy Act, passed in Congress in 1995, initiated the moving of the embassy, but has been vetoed since every American president since. The Sanhedrin calls on Trump to withhold the veto after he takes office. The Sanhedrin also recalled Putin's connection to the temple in its letter. During his third official trip to Jerusalem in 2012, Putin paid a late-night visit to the Kotel, Western Wall. When he arrived at the holy site, the Russian leader stood in silence for several minutes, offering up a personal prayer after which he read psalms from a Russian Hebrew prayer book. An Israeli bystander called out in Russian, Welcome, President Putin. Putin approached the man, who explained the importance of the Temple Mount and the Jewish Temple. Chadrua Charadim, an Orthodox Hebrew news site, reported that Putin responded, That's exactly the reason I came here, to pray for the Temple to be built again. After this remarkable exchange, the Sanhedrin sent a letter to Putin calling on him to fulfill his prayer. At the time, President Putin did not respond to the Sanhedrin's request, but now that the incoming U.S. president is a potential ally in the project, the Sanhedrin believes it is time for Putin to take an active role in rebuilding the temple. In addition to its requests concerning the temple, the Sanhedrin is also calling on Putin and Trump to renew the 1920 League of Nations resolution known as the San Remo Treaty, which essentially enabled the creation of a Jewish state by dividing the Ottoman Empire. It incorporated the Balfour Declaration, 
issued by Great Britain in 1917, which gave official recognition and backing for the establishment of Israel. The leaders of Russia and America can lead the nations of the world to global peace through building the temple, the source of peace, Rabbi Weiss explained. This will offset the disgraceful UNESCO resolutions that are the root cause of increasing terror and violence. the spirit of humanity in the dawn of a new American era. In a season when many commemorate the birth of Christ, we commemorate our own genesis, the enlightenment of all humanity, a revelation of our nature as written in the annals of history, a gift from Lucifer, the light bringer, the morning star, and the rebel. We are Satanists. We engender moral, spiritual, and sexual freedom, personal independence, and insist upon personal choice in all things. 
We care for the significance of the individual spirits and personal moral responsibility. If you stand here today and embrace your nature, or free-thinking, self-governed, and godless, you too are a Satanist in the eyes of many in your own community, including those who represent you in your government. We are also Americans. We are seeking collaborators, individuals for a visionary satanic alliance, leaders of the new American era. To liberty, humanity, and, and just time to awaken to the satanic emancipator and end of repressive traditions. Hail Satan! I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts the say, come. come, But tonight, see. because of what we did on this day, in this election, at this defining moment, change has come to America. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Secret Service agents call the presidential limousine the beast. And if spy photos are any indication, President Obama's new ride lives up to the name. You guys have a nickname for this car. Well, what's it called and why do you call it that? Uh, it's often referred to as the Beast, the Beast, the Beast. And that's the new limousine. Yeah, the Beast. They call it the Beast. Best beast. Because it's uh, beefed up. It's got all sorts of capabilities uh, uh, to uh, make a smooth ride, but also a very safe ride. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. How art thou fallen from heaven? O Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. Did Jesus really reveal the name of the Antichrist? I will report the facts. You can decide. In Luke chapter 10 verse 18, Jesus said these words. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning falling from the heavens. These words are written in Greek and translated to English. However, Jesus spoke these words originally in Aramaic, which is the most ancient form of Hebrew. As you know, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. If a modern Jewish rabbi were to speak these words of Jesus today, he would speak them in Hebrew, much the same way that Jesus would have spoken them. So in Hebrew, Jesus said that he saw Satan falling as lightning from the heights or from the heavens. So what are the words for lightning and heights or heavens in Hebrew? From the Strong's Hebrew Dictionary, word number 1299, a primitive root word meaning to lighten or lightning or to cast forth, the word is barak. In the Strong's Hebrew Dictionary, word number 1300, lightning or by analogy a gleam, a flashing sword, or a brightness or a glittering, the Hebrew word is barak. So lightning or a flash of light in Hebrew is pronounced barak or Barak. Now consider this amazing fact. The book of Isaiah is the source of origin for the Christian concept and understanding of Satan, or Lucifer, as Isaiah calls him, in chapter 14, especially in verses 12 through 19. In Isaiah chapter 14, verse 14, Lucifer, or Satan, is credited with these words, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. In the verses of Isaiah that refer directly to Lucifer, several times it is mentioned that Satan has fallen from the heights or from the heavens. The Hebrew word used in this text for the heights from which Satan fell is Strong's Hebrew word 
1116, pronounced Bama. Bama is most commonly used to refer to a high sacred place, as well as to the heights of the heavens or the clouds. In Hebrew, the letter Wa is often transliterated as a U. Some scholars use the O for this transliteration. It is primarily used as a conjunction to join concepts together. So to join in Hebrew poetry the concept of lightning or barak and a high place like heaven or the heights of heaven, the letter U or sometimes O, the Hebrew letter Wa, would be used. So barak o bama or barak u bama in Hebrew poetry, similar to the style written in Isaiah, would translate literally as lightning and the heights or the heavens or lightning from the heights of the skies or the heavens. The word Satan is Satan in Hebrew, a direct translation. So back to Jesus' prophecy in Luke chapter 10 verse 18. If spoken by a Jewish rabbi today, influenced by the poetry of Isaiah, he would say these words in Hebrew, the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 10 verse 18 as, And I saw Satan as Barak Obama. Did Jesus reveal to us the name of the Antichrist? I report, you decide. For many years, the Bible captivated the interest of Ron Wyatt, and he had it in his heart to show people that the Bible is true, that the miracles really happened, and that there is a God who we have to have a relationship with. But his work was to meet great resistance from both fellow Christians as well as scientists who don't want to believe or relate to the living God. Among the many discoveries he made was Noah's Ark, where he was held captive by PKK terrorists in eastern Turkey. and the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah that God destroyed with fire and brimstone. He risked his own life and was imprisoned for one month in Saudi Arabia because he wanted to reveal to the world that at the real Mount Sinai there was archaeological evidence of the Israelites. He also showed where the Red Sea crossing took place and Pharaoh's army drowned and the several evidences under the sea that proved the story was true. He showed the possible place for the Israelite camp in Kadesh Barnea, where Moses struck the rock and the water gushed out. Here, it was obvious that water had once come pouring out of the stone foundation and drained down into the valley, yet nowhere in this vicinity is there any water supply. Most of those who knew Ron 
thought that what made the biggest impression on people was his genuine care for others and his humility. Almost 30 years ago, Ron Wyatt was walking over there between this wall and the Golgotha Escarpment with an employee from the Israeli Antiquities Authority. Suddenly, he raised his hand near to Golgotha Escarpment and he said, that's Jeremiah's Grotto and the Ark of the Covenant is in there. Both of them were very surprised by this statement and Ron received verbal permission to dig there. Ron, who had his regular work beside his archaeological research, travelled home to decide as to whether or not to accept this task. Was the Ark of the Covenant really hidden there? And why, after so many years, did God want to unearth it again? During the Israelites' captivity in Egypt, they mixed a great deal of paganism with the truth of God. It was therefore necessary and important for God to teach them His truth and His commandments all over again. So Moses climbed the mountain and received two tables of stone, upon which God had written his Ten Commandments with his own finger. This is the only thing we have on earth that God has written with his own finger. The only document from the Creator himself. These ten words were called the testimony, as it was God's testimony to the world. Beside the Ten Commandments, there was another covenant they entered into. And this covenant says, if they were loyal to God, then he will choose them over the other nations. They also received civil laws to maintain law and order. And it's important to separate the commandments from the civil laws. The Ten Commandments is a universal law. Moses was directed to build a sanctuary. Everything that he was to build, he would build according to the design of the temple he was shown in heaven. The Ten Commandments, or the Testimony of God as it was called, was put into the Ark, and on this Ark there was a covering that was called the Mercy Seat. It was a place of atonement. After they built it, they placed the furniture in the positions God showed them. The altar of burnt offering symbolized the sacrifice of the coming saviour. And the bronze laver that symbolized cleansing, or cleansing of baptism. And further on into the holy place, we have the table of showbread. With the bread that symbolized God's word, which we should eat. Here on the other side, we have the seven-branched candlestick that was a symbol of God's congregation and the oil that symbolized the spirit that God would send to his people. And further on, we have the altar of incense which symbolized the prayers of the faithful sending up to heaven. Then, in the most holy place, is the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Testimony that Moses was asked to make with the Ten Commandments inside. This symbolized that it was God's Ten Commandments that had been broken and demanded a blood sacrifice. The blood symbolized the Savior that would come and take the penalty for the people who had sinned against their Creator, breaking His commandments. Through the sanctuary, the Israelites were to preserve the meaning behind Jesus' mission to come and die for the world and preserve God's true commandments, the law that had been broken. The sanctuary also showed how mankind could again be reconciled to God. After the Israelites had deceived God and failed the task given them, God allowed Babylon to conquer Israel and capture the temple, allowing it to be destroyed. But before the destruction of Jerusalem, God saw to it that the Ark of the Covenant and the other furniture from the temple were hidden. There have been several theories as to where the Ark was hidden, everything from pagan temples in Ethiopia to caves in the desert. But throughout all history, God has never allowed the Ark to successfully stand among pagan idols. God's struggle to mould the descendants of Abraham into the people who were to prepare the way for the Saviour was not over yet. After their dispersion into other countries, the children of Israel converted. Thus, God returned them to their land and its capital, Jerusalem. Many times, when they were dispersed, just as God foretold, he gathered them back again to their land. They rebuilt the wall and the temple, 
but were never given back the Ark of the Covenant. So what was God's plan for the Ark of the Covenant and his testimony? Did he have another testimony that he wanted to add to the Ark before the world would see it once again? When Ron Wyatt decided to begin excavation, it wasn't as easy as he first thought, but he invested any money he had to finance it. Here, we will let him tell the story in his own words. This was recorded in Zedekiah's Caves in 1997. So anyway, I was walking along the cliff base behind this bus station back in this area. Well, since you saw the cutouts, okay, I was walking through there. My left hand went out without my brain doing it. And my mouth said, that's Jeremiah's Grotto and the Ark of the Covenant's in there. But uh, anyway, in January 6, 1982, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I found the Ark of the Covenant. Right? You would not believe the amount of stone and dirt and everything we had not given our interest up by thinking that just any minute we would find it. You know, for all of that time. Usually the carrot doesn't work for that long a period of time. I think you know about holding a carrot in front of something so, to get it to move. So anyway, we found it. Now, I hadn't thought anything about the crucifixion site. Like everyone else, I thought it was up by that Muslim graveyard on top of that cliff. And in fact, I went up there looking one day for it, and a couple of Muslims kind of helped me off of the <laughs> out of the place. My feet touched the ground about every ten feet. <laughs> but anyway, I didn't see any evidence up there. But as we dug down the face of that cliff, we found those three cutouts. Now, folks, there was only one crucifixion site in Jerusalem, and and so anyway, I prayed, Lord, where shall I go now? Now, we had found the crucifixion place, and I was quite excited about that. So we were looking for the Ark of the Covenant. And if I had had my way, I would have found the Ark of the Covenant, and I would not have found the crucifixion site, because I wasn't looking for it. As always, God had more in mind than I had in mind. As a, uh, more than any of us humans, he says that he will give us more than we can ask or think. And I found that to be very true, and of course you will find that to be very true too, and some of you already have, those that are sharing things with other people. Because today God is taking a strong hand in finishing his work. There was a small dark hole about that big. It didn't look very promising at all. I had my son hand me the flashlight. We had had him sitting where we could see. This was all down in a tunnel. And so I put it up to that hole and there was a big cave chamber back behind that. Have you ever had goosebumps and all of that sort of thing? Just overwhelm you. Well, that's what happened to me. It didn't take us very long to make the hole big enough to get in. I thought the Ark of the Covenant would be sitting right there. So since we had to leave the next morning, we plugged that hole, we came back to the surface, plugged the hole, fixed everything up so nobody could tell where we had been, and left. I had to go home, work, save up some more money, come back. But eventually, I found the Ark of the Covenant, and it was in a chamber that I would not have bothered going in, just like I wouldn't have bothered breaking through the wall. My two sons had gotten very ill in 1982. I sent one of them home Christmas Eve, the other one home New Year's Eve. I owed the hotel $300. I had no money at all. As a friendly Arab let me seat at his restaurant. And that, folks, to me is humiliating. 
Now, there are some things that I'm not comfortable with, and I was experiencing several of them that trip. I decided that I was going to find the Ark of the Covenant or die in the hole. This may sound a little melodramatic, but I was humiliated. I couldn't pay my bill at the hotel. I'd rather be dead than in a situation like that. And that's not good logic. So don't go down and do likewise on that one. So anyway, the, the little Arab guy that was letting us eat at his restaurant, he was a full grown man, but he's about that tall and small, the teeth. So as we went through this cave system, he would crawl into the chambers and I'd give him a light and he'd shine it around and I'd peek through to see if it looked like anything in there. So we did this over and over and uh, we came to this one hole after we had, I mean you wouldn't believe where all we had gone in that cave. However, how many of you have ever been inside a big cave? The tunnels and chambers and all. Hey, you know what I'm saying? We had just been all over the place, up and down, different levels. And at this point in time, we had gone about 45 feet down and then back up. And here this hole was in the wall, about that big around. And it, there was a stalactite hanging right down the middle of it. It's the only stalactite I had seen in the cave that wasn't just little ones. This was a big one, and I have it in my collection of things. So I broke it off, made the hole big enough for him to get in, and he was crawling in there, and I started to hand him the light so he could do what we had been doing, you know, several days. He came tearing out of there. His mind, uh, eyes were big as human eyes can get. And he said, what's in there? What's in there? I'm not going back in there. And I said, well, what did you see? He said, I didn't see anything. And I thought, well, okay. Now, he had been in tighter places than that and had not responded that way. So I got this little beam of light, you know, in a very dark place here. And I thought, that is divine terror. You know, that's supernatural terror. So I figured there's got to, that is either where the Ark of the Covenant is or it's the way to get to it, one or the other. And God doesn't want this fella to know where it is. So anyway, he said, he, he just said, I, I, am, I must get out of here. So off he went. So I made the hole big enough for me to get in. I got in there, and folks, it was full of rocks, bigger than these here, up to within 18 inches or so of the ceiling. If this young man hadn't been terrorized and come scooting out of there like he did, I would not have gone in that place. But who needs rocks? We've been moving thousands of them for three years. So anyway, I crawled in there with a the flashlight, and I crawled around on top of the rocks, and I shined the light down between the cracks in the rock, and there a gold, flat gold thing uh, reflected back at me. So I moved over and shined down to another. There was two reflections, one here, one there, and one over here. So I knew it was a flat gold top. And I thought, the Ark of the Covenant, I forgot about the cherubims, you know, sitting on top. They'd have been poking up through it. That was the top of the mercy seat. But anyway, I started moving these rocks, and I stuck them everywhere I could. By the time I got down to that gold surface, I had them behind my shoulders, leaning back against them, and uh, it, turned, it was the table of showbread. Well, hey, that's not a bad thing, huh? <laughs> but anyway, I was looking for the Ark of the Covenant, and it was only then that I took time to carefully examine the rest of the chamber. See, I had just crawled in, took a quick look, and started checking down under the rocks. So as I moved the flashlight along the wall, I saw a stone box sitting against the wall about this 
low, this much space between it and the ceiling. The lid was broke, slid around, and right above it was a crack with dark brown looking material at the bottom of, on the bottom of this crack. And I was able to see the top of the lid of the box. On both sides of the broken pieces was more of this brown stuff. All of a sudden I realized I was sitting in front of the Ark of the Covenant and that Christ's blood had come down. I had never heard anybody preach anything about that sort of conversation. And it was too much for me. I, when I regained consciousness and looked at my watch again, 45 minutes had passed. From the time I crawled in the chamber, because I figured I'd find the Ark of the Covenant in there, I wanted to know what time it was. So anyway, it was 2 o'clock when I entered the chamber. And after I regained consciousness, it was 2.45. I couldn't see down in there, but I knew what it was. Later, Ron Wyatt would confirm that this was the Ark of the Covenant, and that the blood on the mercy seat was from someone who had only one human parent. There were no paternal chromosomes except for one Y chromosome. Jesus was God's only begotten Son, just as he said he was. The Bible prophesied that Christ's blood would be sprinkled on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. But as it was to be kept secret until our time, it was partially, but not totally, hidden in symbols. Matthew recorded an earthquake at the cross, which formed a crack in the ground below it. John tells us that when the Roman soldier pierced the side of Christ, blood and water ran out. The blood and water apparently ran down the earthquake crack. The prophet Isaiah wrote that Jesus, when he was bruised and broken, would sprinkle many nations. Jesus himself said, when he initiated the communion service, that he would enter into a covenant with all people through his blood, the blood of the covenant. The blood would confirm this covenant. When Jesus became the sacrifice, he sprinkled his blood himself and thus fulfilled the role of the high priest. He then became both high priest and victim. Paul told us that Jesus confirmed the covenant in the same way as Moses confirmed the old covenant with the Israelites. When Daniel was given the task of prophesying of the coming Messiah, he made a clear reference to the mission of Jesus. To finish the transgression, and to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. It's also written, that when Jesus died, the curtain between the holy place and the most holy place was ripped in two, but the Ark of the Covenant was not there. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. Right before the Babylonians besieged Jerusalem and destroyed the temple, the Ark was hidden. The very Ark of the Covenant, with the testimony of God, or the law, that the people had broken, and that we need atoning for. God knew where Jesus was to suffer and die for humanity, and, 600 years before the crucifixion, he hid the Ark right under the Golgotha Escarpment. So what does this discovery tell us? Well, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God really did give his Son, to take upon himself the punishment for our sins. But this discovery tells us much more. It tells us what God's covenant with us is, and what law we have broken, and need forgiveness for.
has told us, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. In other words, it don't matter what we've done in the past. It doesn't matter how weak and sinful our natures are. Christ made provision for all of that. And he died for us. All we have to do is go to the Father in the name and blood of the Son and ask for forgiveness and rehabilitation so we become Christ-like and we will be ready at His coming. And folks, when the Holy Spirit sets up housekeeping in our hearts, we will develop a love for lost souls that will constrain us to do those things which are very inconvenient, time-consuming, expensive, and all of that. And that is working for lost souls. And when Christ comes, instead of fleeing and trying to hide from the face of Him that sits on the throne, we'll look up and say, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him. And he will save us. And that's our choice today.
Thank you.